since April 6, 2002. And like um, Paul said, we're going to be doing, we're going to be talking about the 30th anniversary of George Mason's um, independence as a university. And so let me just uh, ask the first question. Um, as governor, uh, how did you view George Mason College? And what place did it have in Virginia's higher educational system back then in 1970s? I'd say that as of the, about that time, George Mason was just beginning to get uh, the real attention of all of the state. Uh, Tim Thompson was the majority leader in the House of Delegates when I was elected governor. He represented Alexandria and a good portion of Northern Virginia in the House of Delegates, and he was extremely interested in George Mason. Also, George Cook, who was a Republican council member of Alexandria and one of my supporters, somebody who'd worked very hard in the Republican Party to elect me, he was very much interested in it. But that that was a provincial interest. Uh, George Mason was beginning to be recognized throughout more of the state as being a leading institution or certainly had the potential for real leadership in a very important part of uh, Virginia, particularly with respect to its economy. It was a very valuable area. I recognized it as such. A lot of people didn't, but uh, the population was growing, the economy was growing. It was a great place for a great institution, and I saw that that was going to happen. I was fully supportive of uh, creating an independent university. I had a relationship with uh, the director of the Board of Visitors of the University of Virginia at the time. He happened to be my father-in-law, <laughs> and he and uh, Lauren Thompson were close, and uh, he had recognized that it was time for George Mason to be cast independent from the University of Virginia. So it was, we were all fully supportive of that. And uh, I had the honor of appointing the first board, independent board of visitors of the mm -hmm. uh, George Mason University. And uh, I think that one has stood the test of time. That was an outstanding board of visitors. Till Hazel was one of the people who was on it. George, uh, Jim Thompson, I think, George Cook, uh, Preston Carruthers, there were others that I would recognize and don't remember right now, but it was an outstanding group. Mm -hmm. There were some women on there, I'm, I don't remember who they were right now. What was the nature of your relationship with UVA at the time? Just, UVA was a great institution, I, I had no connection with it except I sort of married into it. Uh, my wife didn't go there, but uh, her brothers were law school graduates of that institution. Her father was Mr. University. He was rector of the Board of Visitors, as I said. Right. He had been in uh, the undergraduate school and graduated from the law school in 1914. Uh, he was very, as many of them are, uh, strongly addicted to the University of Virginia, but nothing could go wrong down there. Uh, so I had that pleasant association with it. Mm -hmm. uh, while while uh, another very definite connection was the fact that Edgar Shannon was president of the University of Virginia. He, he I had met in 1941 when I was a freshman at Washington and Lee. He was a Washington and Lee graduate. He was a member of the fraternity that I joined and probably was responsible for my joining that fraternity. Right. And he and I had overlapped uh, in the Pacific uh, some, he on cruisers and I in the submarine force. But we had had a couple of beers together a couple of times uh, in different places in the Pacific, Guam being one. So I had a great admiration for the fact that he was president of the university. And, uh, one of my university of friends, I remember, asking me when Shannon's selection as president was announced, well, Lynn, what, uh, what is that 
mink they call the Washington League graduate going to do to our university? <laughs> I said, he is going to make a greater contribution to our university than anybody since Thomas Jefferson. Uh, I did not at that time have as much familiarity with the work of Colgate Darden as president of the University of Virginia as I do now, so I probably would qualify that statement a little bit, but Edgar Shannon was an outstanding president of the University of Virginia, did uh, liberal things like turn George Mason loose to become an independent institution, and added uh, immeasurably to the faculty at mm. the University of Virginia. Okay, great. Um, can you talk a little bit about the socioeconomic growth that was occurring in Northern Virginia during that time period, and where would you place George Mason College's growth in, in, the, in that scheme? Well, the area was just taking off. Uh, I had direct observation of it because I campaigned up here a whole lot. Uh, I remember one of my rural friends in Southside Virginia saying, why do you campaign so much up there around Washington? <laughs> and I said, and my response was, because I can count. <laughs> it, it was true. <coughs> the center of activity here then was Arlington. Arlington had the reputation for the outstanding leadership. Arlington had tried to lead the rest of the state in uh, solving the, quote, integration crisis, close quote. Uh, they didn't recognize it as a crisis. They were willing to have integrated schools. They had outstanding schools. Ed Camel and his wife Elizabeth were outstanding leaders in that community for education and so those of us who were thoughtful about it looked to Northern Virginia for the leadership potential that it had. I certainly did. And I, I not only campaigned up here a lot, but I recognized what was happening. Uh, but it was just beginning uh, as far as anything outside of Arlington was concerned. I can illustrate that by saying that I went to a shopping mall in Tyson's Corner campaigning one Saturday afternoon, and uh, you can't believe how involved you get submerged, this may be a better word, in the campaign process when you're running for a statewide office and you've been doing it for some time, every day, all day, for six days a week. And I went through a shopping mall in Tyson's Corner that was just opening up and uh, steamed through there shaking hands. I'm Linwood Holton. I'm a candidate for governor. I turned the corner and took my hand out and said, I'm Linwood Holton. I'm campaigning for governor. It was a mannequin. <laughs> <laughs> but there weren't many people around, but they were coming and they came. <laughs> okay. Um, when the movement for George Mason, when did the movement for George Mason independence come to your attention? I don't remember. I, I think that was on the the uh, agenda when I took office, mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, January 1970. And I'm sure that uh, people like Jim Thompson and Till Hazel and George Cook were active in bringing that to my attention. And I just remember that uh, in a general way there was movement toward making George Mason independent. Um, there were I, th I think Mary Washington was made independent at about the same time, and so there was, uh, there was the movement included both institutions. I think there may have been uh, some hesitancy about Mary Washington and about whether it was uh, quite ready for uh, independence. And, and oh, and there was the third one, what's now the Clinch Valley College, uh, a university college at, at Wise. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the, the determination was made that while it should become an, a four-year four -year institution, it was not ready to be independent of the University of Virginia and still isn't. Uh, 
and it's still a part of the University of Virginia, and properly so. Mm -hmm. But those three uh, were involved in the movement to make them independent, and uh, um, as far as George Mason was concerned, and there was any real hesitation about doing it mm -hmm. that I know, no opposition to it that I know of. Wow. Okay. Um, Including the Board of Visitors, uh, was through, with whom I was communicating through my father-in-law, the rector. Okay. Uh, what was the relationship between uh, your office and Chef during your tenure as governor, and how did that relationship affect the, the George Mason independence movement? Well, Roy McTonaghan, who was the director of uh, Chef, um, was a very impressive uh, scholar and leader, and he uh, was in favor of the independence. I had great respect and admiration for him and for his views on that. Um, he was only there a couple of years. I, I've forgotten where he went from that job, but he left about the middle of my term. Mm -hmm. And I expect that I've forgotten his successor's name, but I think he, the successor stayed a long time and only recently left and went to Kentucky. I think the Gilmore administration fired him, as a matter of fact. And, uh, but both of those directors were in favor. I had a regard for Chev. <clears throat> um, we had, through the years, observed the consolidation movement in North Carolina, and that seemed to me, that was a consolidation of those colleges into one unit. It seemed to me that that presented an unwieldy organization that eliminated some desirable competitive elements. Mm -hmm. And so I was not in favor of consolidating our colleges. Uh, Chev seemed to me to be a middle-of-the-road approach to uh, the need for eliminating or avoiding duplication, uh, but uh, also ensuring the development of specialties like communications uh, that since have become so important uh, on the initiative of individual competing institutions like George Mason and the University of Virginia and William and Mary and so forth. Mm -hmm. James Madison's another prominent one. Right. Um, as you understood it, what were the reasons for George Mason to separate from UVA? Well, it was big enough and uh, capable of sustaining itself on an independent basis and uh, certainly was entitled to the prestige of becoming a, a, a separate institution and uh, probably was going to be uh, in a much better uh, growth pattern uh, when it was separated from its mother's apron strings. Uh, and certainly that has been true. They've been, it's been a highly competitive organization and very aggressive, progressive and aggressive. And uh, the growth here and uh, has kept up with, I think, with the uh, growth of the economy and the population. And certainly the specialties that have been developed at George Mason University are extremely important to the continuation of the economy here. Great. Um, who else were the major players of the independence movement during that time, and what were the roles that they played? And uh, I know you said that there weren't, uh, you don't remember anybody being against independence, but who was really for independence that you can remember? Well, my knowledge would be mostly, or, or recollection at least, would be mostly of the political forces. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, Jim Thompson, who was the majority leader in the House of Delegates, was a prominent leader. Uh, I don't remember about the Senate, uh, though uh, Charlie Fenwick had been in the Senate. I did not know Charlie Fenwick except casual greetings at University of Virginia functions. He was a close friend of my 
my uh, in-law family. Uh, and that's strange. Abe Brault, I guess, was in the Senate, and uh, I'm sure he was in the Senate, and uh, Clive, Duval, Clive Duval was not there yet, uh, not in the Senate at that time. He, he went to the Senate while I was there. Uh, Oh, there's a prominent senator, Hearst, Homer Hearst, was a prominent member of the Senate from Northern Virginia. He represented Fairfax County itself. And while I don't remember that they had active roles, I'm confident that they did because there was general consensus among the Northern Virginia delegation to make it independent. It was a matter of prestige, and, and uh, they were all in favor of it. Okay. Now, the scholars who were impre impressed with it, uh, Lauren Thompson was certainly one of them, uh, but I didn't have that much contact with him. I don't remember that much about his activity on it. Okay. Um, what did you see as the future of George Mason once it became an independent university as opposed to have it been um, still part of UVA? Well, uh, as I mentioned, it would it became a competitive force, and one of those forces who uh, voiced the need for new specialties. Communications was something that really didn't exist uh, in the way that it does today. At the time George Mason was created, but here was an institution that was in the middle of what became the high tech economy. And it kept up with uh, the uh, technological developments. Uh, you've got a great faculty member here whose name I don't remember. He's a, a real whiz uh, in, I think, physics and uh, electrical engineering. Harry, uh, he was a neighbor of mine on Claiborne Drive when I lived in McLean, and his name may come to me in a minute. But I ran across him again, and I ran across the university again when I was president of the Center for Innovative Technology, mm -hmm. which started in 1988, I think, and went through 93. And I was able then to see what had happened at George Mason University in the communications from and uh, information management uh, technology field, and it had filled the role that we all anticipated for. The university had filled the role that all of us anticipated for it in keeping up with the new developments and providing an opportunity for young people, bright young people in this area, to receive that training and uh, contribute to the economy through those dot coms that exists so prevalently even after all the failures is right. still very prominent. <laughs> okay. Um, this is kind of related to this, the last question, but um, how would you describe George Mason's first 30 years? Outstanding success and tremendous progress. One of the things that I did uh, when I was on a budget tour here was authorize the purchase of a little square of land down there on Braddock Road, I think we're about where the entrance is right now. Uh, and the university had acquired land along Braddock Road uh, on the west side, I guess it is, and then some on the east side, but this little track just looked like city lots, still owned by somebody else. And I remember that one of the requests in the budget tour, probably in 71 or 73, three was uh, give us some money to buy that land and I was delighted to be able to close it up. <laughs> but that was uh, the, the culmination of bringing together of the campus property and all, at that time those were woods down there. Uh, there wasn't any, uh, there weren't any buildings. Uh, this building where we're sitting, the library, the Fenwick Library didn't exist, the Johnson Center didn't exist. There was no parking garage, wasn't any need for a parking garage. Uh, I don't remember how many students there were, but uh, mostly what you said about George Mason, it has the potential for growth, and it did grow. Mm -hmm. 
it has been a remarkable achievement, and it's had outstanding leadership. <clears throat> Lauren Thompson <clears throat> gave it a great start, and uh, uh, the others I didn't know as well, but I've uh, known George Johnson through the years subsequently, and uh, he was, uh, he, he, I, I put college presidents in the category of con artists. They are specialists in uh, reaching their hands into other people's pockets, particularly taxpayers. Uh, George Johnson and Ronald Carrier and uh, Marshall Hahn, you know, George Mason, Jim uh, James Madison, and BBI were specialists in getting taxpayer money for the growth of their institutions. And George Johnson made a fantastic contribution to this campus and this institution with his successful advocacy of its programs before the General Assembly of Virginia and the governors. Okay. Um, this is kind of a, a mirror question of the first question I asked you. Um, where would you place George Mason University now within Virginia's higher educational system? Well, it's one of the major research institutions now. I'm, I don't know, I'm not familiar with the rankings. Mm -hmm the U.S. News and World Report and so forth, but uh, it's it's one of, uh, what, six major research institutions of higher education in Virginia. It's the result not only of its aggressive uh, ambitions, but of a realization in Virginia of the general populace that it was time to make investments in higher education. And we've made substantial investments in higher education, particularly since 1961. We went through a, a, a dark, dark period in our history from 1954 to 1961 when Senator Byrd led us, led us down the dark, dismal road of massive resistance to the orders of the Supreme Court of the United States. That was a terrible period in in Virginia's history, and Harry Bird ought to be ashamed of himself in heaven, even if he's there, for what he did. But beginning in 1961, uh, under the moral leadership of Governor Albertus Harrison, who said, in effect, let's forget about the past and stop this wishing to go back to some kind of antebellum plantation society and make some money. And that laid the groundwork uh, for uh, investments in education generally, and particularly in higher education, that I think are a major responsibility for the economy in Virginia today. Uh, Harrison doesn't get credit for creating the community college system, for example, because uh, the actual appropriations and the creation of that system were done under Governor Mills Godwin. But it is a fact that uh, the recommendation for the community college system came out of a commission that was appointed by Governor Harrison during his term, which was from 1961 to 1965. Uh, the significant point is, though, that Harrison laid the groundwork, got us started thinking about the future instead of the past. And fortunately, Godwin, whom I opposed, I was his opponent in the 1965 race for governor when he ran as a Democrat. But I nudged him into commitments for education that he probably would not have made had he had no competition. In any event, the outcome was that uh, he supported developments in education, both public education and higher education, and most significantly, he advocated and got the General Assembly to pass the new creation of sales tax, which provided the funds, most of the funds, that were in later, in under his direction, under my direction, and subsequent governors and General Assemblies were invested in higher education and made possible the outstanding research universities that we have, 
also the outstanding teaching universities that we have, publicly supported, and the public school system that, though not at the top of the list, is supportive of those public institutions of higher education, and we will, I think, now make the investments again in education that caused it to come to where it, come to where it is, and we'll, we'll, we'll provide for further growth in the future. Okay, great. Okay, I just want to make sure we had enough tape left for the right. last question. All right. Um, can you talk a little bit about your legacy regarding higher education? I know you touched upon that in the last question. Um, and, and also, where would you put George Mason on that list of, I guess, your accomplishments regarding higher education during your tenure as governor? Well, taking the last part first, there are a lot of buildings around here that came out of appropriations that I signed between 1970 and 74. Uh, <clears throat> I was in the good fortune as governor to have a lot of money. Uh, not only was the sales tax coming to fruition, it, it, it had been passed by Godwin in a step-by-step -step basis uh, so that it increased and the real proceeds of the sales tax began to be collected by the state during my administration. Coincidentally with that, uh, Richard Nixon, who was President of the United States, had advocated a program of revenue sharing, which culminated during my term. So I got some money from the federal government that was without strings and could be applied to whatever we wanted. In addition, because we needed some extra funds, even in all that affluence, to clean up the rivers, uh, by a series of efforts, I was able to get the General Assembly to pass, a, in effect, a 1% increase in the income tax. So proceeds of that were beginning to be collected during my term. And for my last, uh, well, no, next, uh, for the middle budget, uh, I had lots and lots of money to invest in capital outlay. Uh, and most of it went to the educational institutions, to the higher education institutions. I remember a funny discussion I had with the majority leader of the Senate, Bill Hopkins, uh, who opposed the, some of the capital outlay that I had proposed. And I got him in the office and talked to him about why he was opposing it, because I thought it was very important for the state. And he said, well, I, I think they're important too, but you can't spend that much money in two years. And my response to that was, well, you appropriate it and watch. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I've had numerous requests from the institutions of higher education for capital outlay buildings. Even one of them wanted a swimming pool that was important to, that was Clinch Valley. Uh, laboratories, libraries, all of them were important, and I had a, an extensive list of needed facilities uh, that had been requested by the presidents of those institutions. And I remember going through the list in response to Hopkins' opposition, because they did pass that bill, and I was charged with the responsibility to spend that money. I went through the list of projects, the schedule when they were due to be completed, and just with my own hand, without any technical knowledge, cut 60 days here down to 30 days there and took six months off of this schedule and put it down to three and just went through it. I didn't know what I was doing, but I was, except that I was accelerating the construction of those projects. And, uh, I didn't know whether it could be done or not, but it was reasonable, but I was giving them something to shoot at. And the way I handled it with the institutions was, now this is what I want you to do. This is your schedule. This is my schedule, which is much faster. I'm sending my schedule out to you. If any of you feels that you can't meet that schedule, come up to the governor's office and talk to me about it. <laughs> Nobody came. <laughs> <laughs> and they completed that schedule on my 
terms, and uh, I could look at Bill Hopkins and say, see, I told you, I spent it. <laughs> so I made a major contribution to some of those capital outlays. Okay. Um, okay. Do you have any follow-up questions? I, no follow-up questions, but um, I was just wondering whether we missed something. Um, Perhaps you had some observations on some of the questions we uh, talked about we didn't get to, and if you have a moment to expand on anything. Nothing comes to my mind right now. I, uh, I think in answer to that last question about uh, my legacy for George Mason and, and education generally, I think the record will show that I was very supportive of um, public and higher education in Virginia and that my appropriations, uh, which is the major policy development that the governor has, uh, were strongly supportive of educational opportunity for Virginia citizens. We. Uh, one of the problems that we had in those days, as we still have and will always have, is the disparity between the counties that are more affluent than others and those that have less resources. And uh, a major revision of the aid to local localities for education was adopted at my instance uh, by the Office of public construction, which deals with the public schools, and uh, <clears throat> and I made commitments for teacher salaries that uh, had to extend through the years. You couldn't cut them back once you got them used to that higher level, so they had to support those higher salaries. Also, my income tax, which was passed, the increase that was passed in the income tax was for a specific purpose to, to make, make matching funds available for cleaning up the rivers, but uh, the funds were fungible and uh, were there and have been there for now 30 years that have been available in the general fund for allocation to educational opportunities among other needs. So uh, I, I, I'm very proud of the record that I have in support of, of education and of uh, higher education uh, and George Mason. And one of the most recent specific actions that I took uh, were with respect to George Mason's law school. Uh, Ed Willey, who was in the Senate, a very senior senator representing the Richmond area, uh, was somewhat provincial in his outlook and a little bit skeptical about <coughs> those Yankees up in Northern Virginia. <laughs> so people were doubtful about whether he would uh, support the law school, and he was instrumental as chairman of the Finance Committee of the Senate in whether that appropriation would be passed or not. And I had a nice conversation with Ed, Ed probably to request of Till Hayes or George Cook or some of the others in Northern Virginia who had the provincial interest in this direction. And I had a good conversation with Ed and, and uh, urged him to support appropriations for George Mason's Law School and uh, got a commitment from him that he would, uh, mostly on the grounds that this will be a law school that uh, will tend to be self-sufficient. Uh, there are lots of people who are now going to more expensive law schools over in the district who will come to George Mason's law school. And there will be people, those people will include people who live both in the district and in Virginia. So uh, it looks like a pretty good investment from an actual direct expense basis, but certainly is a good investment to provide a law school for that growing population up there. And the result, the, the, the summary of that conversation was that Ed committed to support it, and he, that that ended any possibility that it wouldn't be appropriated. Oh, great. Do you have any follow-up? Okay. 
Okay. Well, thank you very, very much. This is most enlightening. Yeah. Well, very wonderful. It certainly adds to our historic program. I'm happy to do it. And if you want to get more general some other time, just give me a call. I'm helping that up here occasionally. Good. I'm working on a rail to Dulles project now with Senator Rob. Oh. Yeah.